Bull is an American writer, teacher, and translator currently living in New York City. He is best known for his novel, The Divinity Student, winner of the International Horror Guild Award for Best First Novel in 1999. His novel, The Great Lover, was nominated for the Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel of the Year and declared the best weird novel of 2011 by the Weird Fiction Review. He has described his work as de fiction. In 2015, his next novel, Animal Money, will be published. Please join me in welcoming Michael Sisko. I vote. Can you all hear me? All right. yeah. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming on out. Hopefully you won't regret it. Uh, I'm going to read to you from something. It's an excerpt of a novel that is not yet published, but this excerpt has been published in um, Postscripts to Darkness 5. And this is um, a novel called Unlanguage. And the premise of the novel is essentially that it's a very, very strange instruction textbook about an impossible language, which includes lessons. I'll give you a little lesson. Being a professor, I could do that. And uh, a reading from uh, the book. So this is from Unit 37. We're well into the book by then. Prepages. And I'll try to keep this in time. Prepages. However innocent each individual instance of preposition may be, taken as a whole, the use of prepositions is the grammatical equivalent of sodden. <laughs> that is to say, an unnatural act which goes against the very grain of language, replete with improper pleasure. The preposition, when dragged away from the other words, isolated and interrogated, cannot account for itself. It is a parasite with no meaning of its own. Its behavior follows no strict pattern. Now it is found here. Now it is found there. Wandering, aimless, rootless, with no fixed employment, no documentation, no destination. The stability of grammar requires a strict quarantine of propositions, and their use must be severely controlled. Preposition poses a direct threat to the very concept of case. This is why immortal cases alone may be used in conjunction with prepositions, as only that which is immortal and unchanging will be sufficiently impervious to the demonism of preposition. <laughs> with proper care and treatment, and unstinting use of the ablative case, prepositions can become useful parts of speech. Even so, it is not always clear, once the preposition becomes involved, that the immortal noun has not been somehow not exactly altered, well, then cast in a certain altered light. Unlanguage makes use of a number of different categories of grammatical hybrids, one of which involves the combination of prepositions and adjectives. The prepage will provide the quality of the adjective with a vectrality, and by means of the preposition, which is analogous to spin in atomic physics, the adjective must be in one of the ablative cases, and the preposition is suffixed to it entire. Examples would include up white, by sour, at recent, above vague, beside clear, toward round, down sick, in soft, along late, from said, after quick, under insane, without next, out dead, away rotten. Unit 37, reading. Interview excerpt, conduct, conducted 24-22 at 17-10-57, VIP, inmate, that's volunteer inmate patient number, uh, 31415, etc. And I should point out that I didn't do any blow before the show. The snips are in the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> they would uh, take us in a bus to the far side of the hospital grounds three times a week. We had to enter the minds of old people and wreck their memories and motor control and sometimes other neurological faculties using ancient Darrow technology that hospital administrators had found somewhere. Uh, we had to go into this cavern. It was uh, dark. You couldn't see the walls or the ceiling. 
and you could just make out big shapes of things up there. You had to go into this sort of gazebo. It stood all by itself with cables coming out of the base and down into the rock or going up from the top into the dark. The gazebo was made of metal that looked like chalk and there was a pillar like a candlestick in the middle of a, with a black metal ball on top like maglite metal and you had to sit in the chair and put the backs of both your hands in these stone, these clear stone cradles when it then would respond to you based on your brain energy level. Right, I had a lot, so the moment I put my hands in the shells, they would just light up and this just big tube of light would just shoot up and from the top of the ball and all the machinery starts up. There's overhead, there's, you can barely see them, but there's big spinning onion things, onion shaped things like tops, and there's chiming and a rumble and giant transparent gears made of light, flashing different colors like glass and sunlight and rolling. They just hang there and machine parts made of fire, oozing flame tubes and cones, fire anemones, all kinds of fires, so that at first you don't realize that you're looking at flames. Some are small and very close to, like they make clusters, like, like bunches of flowers, and with the gears meshed together, transparent and just hanging in space. So from there, you'd go through a hatchway, a thick metal hatchway, one at a time, and that would get us into the brains of the patients in a hospital for old people that the administrators had the coordinates for. We had to go through the mines and disconnect the parts that were designated for us by these like cubes of yellow light, and which were projected by the surgeons on trouble spots. Trouble for them, not for the patients. We were doing this to create more work for the doctors, I guess. It was like diffusing a bomb. You, you had to look at the thing. Like you'd be looking at a dog, sitting there, wagging its tail, or a bag of golf clubs, or a grandchild or something, old-fashioned dancing, and find the different colored filaments inside and up, unhook them in the right order. If you got the order wrong, you could get stuck. And then you could be mistaken for a memory or an imaginary person and integrated into the old person brain while your body back in the cavern would be in a coma before you could get, get loose or it might kill the patient if you did anything to affect the autonomic nervous system. Motor nerves were okay. And we all stole. I took a lot less than the others. They take watches and radios and things, whatever. The problem though was, the reason I didn't want to really care to take anything much was that it was all memory hardware. So, you know, like a flashlight would be an old flashlight and the batteries wouldn't work when you brought it back because it would be 40 years old or something. I took a ring, jewelry, you know, stuff that wouldn't break. I took some old photos, you know. I took a brick once just to see if I could bring it back. That's it, that one there. Yeah, I know it's like any other brick, but I brought that one back. That was in someone's memory. It's amazing how clear the memories are. Like a handkerchief with the weave and everything. Really incredible. What I mainly took was the nerves. I, once you unhook them, there's no function for that nerve anymore. So I could just keep it. Uh, but you had to find the other end to unhook that or it would just snap back. You know. Everyone in the program had an enhanced nervous system because you could just hook them up into yourself. You'd use it to enhance your nervous system. you just do it, you know. you just put it like that. you just put it inside. Everyone had an enhanced nervous system. But I'm the one who thought of recycling the nerves. That was my idea. <laughs> the patient enters the city inside the forest, inside the barren plain that was at one time swept by the beams of negation from a half conical structure full of foam. The city is in the forest, meaning the trees grow among the buildings, and there are no open vistas as there are in regular cities. In a sense, the city is like an overgrown derelict invaded by trees, and in another sense, it is built around the trees. The 
skip ahead a bit. <clears throat> the patient trudges into a, a scene, two lovers in a meadow. A patient trudges into the scene, intent on his duty, if not enthusiastic about it. He crosses the threshold of the small adobe house and is back under the canopy of the trees, but something has changed. The daylight has vanished, the forest floor is like a huge sable rug. The trees are like golden sketches, scratched on a black background. Their branches adorned with dim stars or medallions that give off blurry rays. He can see his own hands in a dim, uniform, golden light that casts no shadow. There are, he notices now, small golden medallion or star flowers or shrubs dotting the forest floor as evenly as designs on a carpet. Weaving in and out of the trees, looking for his next house, the patient encounters a miniature lion with the head of a young boy. The lion explains that he's a hallucination agent working for Pan. <laughs> and he asks him, what are you doing with me? The patient's voice is rusty with disuse. I'm wrecking old people's nervous systems. I'm from the state psychiatric hospital. You are one of the minions, the creature says, of the teacher whose mouth never stops dripping blood. What are you serving him for? The patient shrugs. It just kind of happened, he said shamefacedly. It's his own blood. <laughs> <laughs> the chimera says, I improve fantasy and, and father images in the minds of the elderly and the mentally infirm. What, what have you got there? A slight but distinct sharpness comes into this creature's tone as it asks this question, indicating with a forehoof the bulge in the front of the patient's coverall. He unzips and sheepishly pulls out a handful of nerves that struggle feebly, like half dead worms. The creature looks at him sadly. You must stop. I can't, the patient answers with dignity. I'm bound by ancient Darrow technology from deep below the surface of the earth. I can't quit. I gotta drain my weird. My body is back there still. This is this this form is only a robot. I don't want my body walking off without me. The patient has already intuited the creature as a projection like himself, serving in some parallel but opposite cause. It will understand what he means without requiring further explanation. So the agent, the chimera, is encouraging him to quit, and he says, you know, and drop out of class, and get an F on my record? Why would you stay? Are you kidding? Oh my God, you don't know what it's like. You've never been down into the Darrow Cavern and gone through. I don't know how you get projected, but man, the way we go, the curtain just goes over you, and then it's all lights and darks with it's kind of like a fountain in the dark, like total dark, and these fires blast up and move and go out and blast, and then light goes over you like the sun, summer sun, and that negative beat comes on, like un, 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 un. You go straight up the negative machine, and you're like, I'm a bird, I'm a train. You're like lifted up to space edge with negative and just held there negative velocity with the sun blazing right next to you at the rim of the crystal star disk at the outermost negative point where the darkness is transformed into super darkness a million times denser and more rapid than the false darkness of Earth since the betrayal of neutral esteem and anti-history. And then it's like, okay, you get to do this, you get to see this, but now you have to go back and fuck up old people's minds. <laughs> And that's not